Amen. Appropriate song for an appropriate day. Jesus is coming. And it's one of the things as I look at the news and look at everything going on in our world today, the only thing it does is remind me that Jesus is coming. And I hope that you are ready uh, for his return. I hope that you are ready uh, for the trumpet to sound. Because it could sound this morning before church even lets out. And I hope that you are ready for that. And uh, I want to be an encouragement to you today. And I told you earlier with everything that's going on in our world today, I really feel like it is my job as the local church pastor here at Belvoir to encourage the saints, equip the saints, and strengthen uh, the saints. Uh, we have been devastated this week in the news, and you looked and uh, heard about Kim Davis, and that obviously is not going to be the entirety of my message, but I will say that this sermon is an outflow of situations that have occurred this week, and I had a preacher friend of mine quote this verse, and, and the Lord just kind of kept it in my mind and my heart all week long, and I began to really look at it and say, well, this is where the Lord's leading me this week. And of course, we all know the name Kim Davis, lady who stood on the Word of God and would not uh, fill out a marriage license for the homosexuals based on her belief in the Word of God and what God has to say about marriage. I told you several weeks ago that God is getting ready to come back, but I also told you several weeks ago that the furnace is getting ready to get hotter. Uh, God is getting ready to separate the men from the boys. I told you, this is happening. It's happening in our own eyes. I, have, I don't have to prove this to you. I think we are all aware of what's taking place uh, in our country. And it's important. It's important that we understand the Word of God and what it has to say in these situations. I want to encourage you today because it's so easy to be discouraged when you turn on the television and you see the things that, that are happening. And I, I often wonder if I'm even living in America anymore. You know, we are living in a time where our nation is a mess. Now, I love the, the red, white, and blue. I love our nation. I love our soldiers. I love our troops. Uh, we, we dedicate several days during the year to just honor our troops and our soldiers and our lawmen and our officers and we stand behind them. Amen? Amen. And it's amazing that as we live in this country, that a Muslim has more rights than we do. It's amazing to me that everybody has rights besides the Christian. And I, it's, it's very sad. And we can sit here and we can argue about it and we can talk about it and we can mull it over. I know it's been talked about not only in our Congress, not only uh, in uh, the places of work, and our, everywhere we go, it seems like these things are being discussed, and it's very easy to get discouraged. But what we see in the church here in Acts chapter 12, you have your Bibles today, turn to Acts chapter 12. We see the church going through persecution. Not in the way that we see it today. Thank God we still have a little bit of freedom left. That we can come and worship the Lord and we can gather here and preach the word of God and say thus saith the word of God without apology. But the church at this time was facing persecution by the hands of Herod. We see that James had already been murdered. The Bible tells in the first few verses there that, that James, Herod stretched out his hand against the church and he assaulted the apostle James and killed him. Now what was so significant of that, that? Well, he was in the inner circle, was he not? We've done a series on the disciples not too long ago. Peter, James, and John. James was one of the figureheads of the church, uh, of the early church. And so he reached out his hand and he killed James by the sword. And now Herod turns his attention over to the main gun of the church. And that was the apostle Peter. And he begins to seek him. And the Bible tells us he captures Peter and throws him in jail. Now, what we find here, that the church was in trouble. There was, it was a time of turmoil. And I think it's very easy to say that you and I are living in a time of turmoil in our world. And we can really relate to what's going on here in the passage of Scripture. Think about it. James had been killed. Peter was on his way 
to be killed. Persecution was the rule of the day and it seemed hopeless. The leader of the church that Christ had left behind was getting ready to die. Let us read Acts chapter 12 as we now know the background. The Bible says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four uh, quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison. Now, we look at this point and we see that it's just utter hopelessness. The church has been devastated, but then things change. And this is really where my sermon is embedded this morning. This is, I was reading this passage this week, and when I got to the next two words, it's like God sent a thunderbolt to my heart. I mean, look at the passage. I mean, James is dead. Peter's on his way. The church is distraught. But what happens? Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison. Here it is. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and the light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind thy hands, or thy sandals, And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wits not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and second ward, or the sentry post, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth out in the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed through the street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary and mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then they said, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. But he beckoned unto them with the hand of, to hold their peace, and declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what had become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down to Judea, Sisera, and there abode. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the word of encouragement that we find in your scriptures. And Lord, that when we are against all odds, Lord, when we have our backs to the wall, Father, there are still things as Christians that we can do. And Father, the challenge this morning is simply to all of us who name the name of Christ. The challenge this morning is to Belvoir Free Will Baptist Church. And Lord, though there are not many things that we may feel that we can do to change this nation, there is one thing that we can do, and that is come to you in prayer. And so, Father, help us to pray for women like Kim Davis and others who have stood uh, for the Word of God and and not uh, faltered in their uh, stand. And Lord, what you want of Belvoir Church this morning, you want us to stand on the Word of God and not falter. And I pray that though the heat may be turned up, that we would be a church that would be found still standing on the Word of God. Lord, I do believe we are living in a days where you are truly separating the men from the boys and the women from the girls. And so, Father, help us today to walk worthy of our calling, to walk worthy of your love. In your precious and holy name we do pray. Amen 
and amen. As we see, the leader of the church was getting ready to die. But prayer was made for him. The Bible tells us a lot about prayer. The Bible tells us in 1 John 5, 14 through 15. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. This morning, do we have confidence in the power of God? And this is the confidence that we have of Him. That if we ask anything, what? Anything according to His will, He what? Heareth us. And if we know that He heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So Scripture, now I could have used several other Scriptures this morning, but it's very clear that God wants us to pray to Him when we have a need. If we have something that is going on, if our back is to the wall, God wants us to come to Him in prayer. That is exactly what the church did in Acts chapter 12. I believe that today, the battle cry today for the church, as after the week we've had, after the few weeks we have seen, it seems that sin is taking over our nation. The battle cry for the church today is not to sit back and do nothing. It is to get on our knees and beg God to intervene. It's not over. We're still here. The fight is still happening. Though it may be the final inning, God has not called us to be quitters. God has not called us to be compromisers. God has called us to be prayer warriors. You say, preacher, I can't go to Congress. I can't run for office. You may not be able to do that. I may not be able to do that. But we can pray. We can enact the power of God. And that's what we see in this passage of Scripture. What do we see about the prayers? What do we see about the the church going to God in prayer in Acts chapter 12? There's a lot of things that we see from this prayer. And it's very obvious the first one is prayer changes things. Isn't it amazing? We read the first few verses of chapter 12 in Acts and it's gloom and doom. James is dead. Peter's getting ready to be dead. And they already knew that once Herod... Hey, Herod was getting his kicks off the people. The Bible tells us the Jews were happy. They were glad that James was dead. And then he turns his guns to Peter. And you know, Herod's just on a kick. He's on a high. He says, hey, and no telling what was going to happen after he killed Peter. He was going to go after the church, most assuredly. And so it was a time of much fear. It was a time of much gloom. It was a time of much doom. But what do we see in Acts chapter 12? If you look at verse 5, we see something changes in this situation. Something takes place. Something transpires and brings this story out of the gloomy mull that it was in. And now that it's come out and we see the glory of God, we see the angel coming, we see that Peter's being released from prison, we see that as the church is praying on their knees, that the answer to their prayer is knocking on the door what we see is prayer changes things I mean it was gloomy I love it in verse 5 Peter was captured but prayer you see it's a wonderful thing when prayer butts in It's a wonderful thing that though the situation may be dark, it's a wonderful thing that though our backs may be to the wall, it's a wonderful thing when prayer butts in. Prayer changes things. They ran to God in their despair. It was hopeless until prayer. We see that prayer changed their gloomy circumstances. And I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what you're facing. But I want you to know something. Prayer changes things. Things. If prayer changed their situation, it'll change your situation. And you know, some of us, we, we've had, we go through situations, we go through problems, and the very last thing we do is come to God in prayer. When the Bible tells us it is prayer that changes things. I, I want you to know this morning, God wants to change your circumstance. God wants to work in your life. And the only way that's going to happen is if you come to Him in prayer. Prayer changes things. I've seen this countless times in my life. And I'm going to come back to that thought at the end of my sermon. But what else do we see about this prayer? Look at verse 5. And prayer was made without ceasing of the church. 
unto God for him. Well, we see that it was a continual prayer. They kept on praying no matter how bad things got. I mean, think about it. I don't know about you, but I think there would be some people that might be scared to be praying and knowing that the government could come in and slit their throat the way they slit James' throat. But the Bible says that they continued to pray even with their lives being threatened and their lives being doomed. They didn't give up on prayer. They didn't stop praying. That's an amazing feat here. We see that prayer this morning, hour by hour, was continual. You imagine as they were praying? You know, I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes I I, I pray and I expect God to answer right away. Anybody like that in here? Anybody ever get frustrated when your prayer doesn't get answered right away? I get frustrated all the time. You know, I give God this little thing. Well, God, I've given my life to you. I've given my life to preach your word. Well, how come you don't answer my prayer? I I get frustrated every now and then. And again, that's wrong of me. But I think you all can identify because when we pray, we just automatically assume, hey, that God should answer our prayer right then and now. Now, we know that that evening God answered that prayer, but could you imagine after an hour of gruesome, intense prayer before God? And matter of fact, the language in the original language suggests that this was an intense, intense, all-enveloping prayer. I mean, they really got a hold of God. And they're praying. You imagine after praying like that. I'm telling you, when you're praying like that, that's exhausting. Anybody ever pray like that? That's exhausting. And and could you imagine that they get up off their knees and maybe go outside and look and see if Peter's there? Or maybe wonder if, if Peter is okay, but yet Peter's still in prison. And the Bible says they continue to pray. The Bible says that they didn't give up on God. They continued to pray for Peter. Now some of us, we've had a need. We have challenges in our life. And I say, have you prayed about it? Oh yeah, preacher, I prayed about it. But nothing ever happened. God don't want us to stop praying. He wants us to continue praying. He wants us to continue coming to Him. To continue to pour our hearts out to Him. And I think, some. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know if any of y'all identify with me. Sometimes... I look at our country and I wonder if it's ever going to get better. I mean, I look at how things are going and and I wonder, and sometimes I wonder if he's even worth praying over. Anybody like that out there? So what's the use? They're just going to do what they want to do. And it's so easy to give up in prayer as we look at our nation and we look at our country. It's so easy to give up and throw in the towel when we've prayed for years and years and years for God to have His will and way and we see nothing but sin and sin and sin dominating our world today and the church being pushed out. Folks, it's not over yet. God didn't say stop praying. God said keep praying. What are we going to do at Belvoir Church? No matter how hot the furnace gets, we're going to keep praying. We're going to keep coming to God with our needs. We're going to keep trusting God. We're going to keep allowing God to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords in our hearts. You see, these individuals would not give up. They would not be deterred. They got a hold of the horns of the altar and they did not let go. What do we need at Belvoir? I mean, not just in the situations that that we find ourselves in, but even in our church and the ministry that God has given us here. We need some saints of God, young and old alike, to get a hold of the horns of the altar and pray like they've never prayed before and ask God to continue to move amongst us. God don't want us to stop. God wants us to continue to pray. Their prayer was continual. Their prayer changed things. In verses 7 through 11, we see that it was a powerful prayer. It wasn't just your ordinary prayer. It was a powerful prayer. Look there in verses 7 through 11. The Bible tells us there, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. And so we see in verses 7 through 11 that God sends an angel as a result of the prayers of the church. And he allows Peter to walk out free. His chains fall off of him. Hey, that was a miracle. Anybody ever seen a miracle? I've seen a few in my life. I've seen things that can't be explained with the exception that God intervened. Well, that's what happened and that's what took place 
Here in Acts chapter 12, it was a powerful prayer. The impossible happened. It was a God thing. God did for the church what the church could not do for itself. And as I'm looking at the news, I can't help but feel so helpless this morning and realize, what can I do? I want you to understand, we need to stop asking ourselves the question, what can I do? And start asking what God can do. Again, this morning, powerful prayer. Getting hold of the horns of the altar and begging God to intervene. Begging God to move. May I tell you that if a holy men and women of God would get right with God and they begin to live for God and get down to this altar and get a hold of the horns of the the altar, I do believe this morning that God would hear our prayer. He would heal our land this morning. We would see powerful prayer. Do we serve a God of the impossible? Do we serve a God that can do anything? There's one thing I've learned about God in the Bible. Don't ever count God out. Because when you least expect it, when when the moment that there's only a twinkling of hope left, God can still move. God can still do the impossible when it doesn't look like He can move anymore. May I tell you, this prayer was a powerful prayer. It made the difference. We see that in the Scriptures. You know, there was nothing different from these church people than you and I. If you're saved here and you're you a part of our church, there's nothing different from these people. These people, the only thing that separates us most of the time from these people is that they went to God in prayer. They truly desired God to move. And they saw a powerful prayer. It was a shocking prayer. Now this part is kind of humorous. But if you look at verses 12 through 16, we find out it was a shocking prayer. And when he uh, considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary the mother and John, and whose surname was Mark, and where many were gathered together praying. What were they praying for? They were praying that Peter would be spared, that God would intervene. And as Peter knocked at the door, the gate, the damsel came and hearkened. And we see Rhoda comes to the door. And it's, it, it's really funny and comical. She gets so excited that their prayer has been answered. She takes off and leaves them outside still. And she goes and she says, hey, Peter's there. And what do they do? You're mad. Here's what they were saying. You crazy. I mean, you ought to sue your brain for non-support. Wait, are you crazy? Ain't no way. They were, and the Bible says that, that, that Peter, they finally realized that, hey, it was Peter. And what does the Bible tell us? In verse 16, look there in verse 16. The Bible tells us that they were astonished. It's a shocking prayer. How many of you have ever experienced shocking prayer? I'm going to embarrass Miss Teresa for a little bit. Miss Teresa... We were talking, I was talking about how, how, how many good things God is doing in our church and uh, seeing souls saved and seeing lives changed. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, there for a while I truly, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I said, Lord, please send revival, send, send something to our church. Lord, I desire for our church to move forward and that you be happy. And I pray and I pray and I pray. And I made a comment from the pulpit about how, you know, I was just, I, you could tell I was shocked on what God was doing. And she made the statement over here by the piano. He said, well, preacher, you prayed for it. I was just like these people in this chapter. I was shocked that God answered prayer. How many of you ever been like that? You've prayed for something and then it happens and you get shocked. It ought not be that way, right? We ought to believe that when we carry something to God in prayer, God's going to hear us and God is going to answer that prayer. It was a shocking prayer. They didn't even believe their own prayer was answered. They prayed to God and God answered and yet they were shocked when God answered their prayer. The word astonished there means to be amazed. It means to be shocked. It means to be beside oneself. It means to be insane. They went crazy. The Bible's saying they lost their minds when they saw Peter. They were that shocked. That God heard and answered their prayers. What does the Bible tell us? Jesus told us this in Mark chapter 11. He says, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. What did Jesus say? 
When you pray to me, pray believing. Remember who you're praying to, church. Don't allow it to be a shocking prayer. What do we see further in the passage? It was a victorious prayer. Verse 17, the Bible tells us in chapter 12 and verse 17, But he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them now how, how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. See, their prayer was a victorious prayer prayer. God was glorified and the victory was won. God removed Herod even later on. If you look at verse 23, the Bible says Herod had elevated himself to a God status. And what does God do? He says, boy, you're getting too big for your britches. So God comes down and smokes him. So you know what God did? He took the problem out of the way. The church won the victory through prayer. You want to know how victory's won in the church today? You want to know how the victory's going to be won in our country today? Prayer. Coming to God in prayer. We rob ourselves of victories in our lives many times all because we fail to not go to God in prayer. Some of y'all are sitting here suffering and going through pain and agony. And the reason why you're going through the situation that you're going to, whatever it may be, you know exactly what it is. God has placed it upon your heart this morning. You've robbed yourself of victory simply because you've not been to God in prayer over it. Again, it was victorious prayer. I like this last part. It was talked about prayer. Look at verse 18. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. The word stir in the Greek means a loud, confused noise. They were amazed at what had happened. They saw, they saw, they walked in and realized that Peter was gone. I mean, they had guards upon guards upon guards and somehow Peter is out. Peter is alive. And man, the guards and everybody in that place, man, they were talking about what God had done. And they didn't realize, they may, some of them may not even realize what God had done, but hey, something had took place. Peter was there and now he's gone and somehow in the midst of hundreds and hundreds of soldiers, Peter's has walked down. Hey man, they were talking about it. Everywhere you went that day in that area, they were talking about what happened last night. You say, preacher, what's your point? What's the big deal about this talked about prayer? It caused these individuals all to think about what had taken place. It showed the world what God can do. I'm telling you folks, it's high time that we as the church of Christ, we as the born again believers of God, show the world what God can do. How do we do that preacher? We hit our knees. And we beg God to intervene in our world, in our church, in our towns, in our cities. Hey, prayer is the key this morning. How much of it are you doing? The church is only as strong as your prayer life. I believe that if we would get serious about this praying business, the world might talk about us a little too. Hey, may, may I submit to you? The world's already talking about us. I was walking out, out in town a couple weeks ago, and I told them who I was. And they began to talk about they knew somebody and talking about people being saved and things happening. And you know, that's all about what God can do. That's a God thing. And isn't it amazing that when God begins to move and people begin to pray and beg God to move and intervene, the world begins to talk about it. Because when God shows up, that's a God thing. And people begin to talk. You say, preacher, what's important about people being taught? So we would look good? No, so God will look good. Mate, God's getting the glory. If we get all the glory, we have totally missed it. Amen? It's all about what He can do. Hey, what are we doing at Belvoir Church? We're pointing to God. We're pointing to the cross. It ain't about you or I. It's about the cross. It's about what God did. Hey, this prayer was talked about. It's high time that we at Belvoir Church begin to intercede for our country and our nation, our leaders. Instead of throwing rocks at them, let's hit our knees and let's beg God to give us better ones. Let's beg God to intervene and do some... Hey, folks, I still believe God can move upon USA. How about you? 
I still believe that God wants to move. I still believe that God wants us to pray today. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what you're going through today. I want you to know that prayer changes things. That God can take your situation today. It may not be about the country. It may not be about the nation. But maybe you've come in this morning with a heavy weight and a burden. I want you to know today, you need to be the first person at this altar and say, God, I've come today because I realize prayer changes things. I've seen this happen in my life several times in the churches that I've served in. I remember when I was at Emmanuel Free Will Baptist Church and I was a bus pastor there on staff. And we'd never really had, I grew up in the church and I, we never really had a, a, a bus, a great big bus ministry. We had a little van. And a preacher by the name of Frank Rice, he comes along and he says, Well, preacher, he says, Henry, here's what I want. In a two-year space of time, I want us to be busting in 100 children. I looked at him, Brother Jeff, and I said, You crazy. Ain't going to happen. In a year's time, we had acquired three buses. We were busting in not one, but 200 people. 100 of them were children that were out in our neighborhoods. The other 100 was Marines. God gave us an opportunity. You've heard me talk about that ministry several times. We would go every Thursday night and visit the Marines there at Camp Lejeune. And we would be able to take them on our bus and bus them into church. And folks, I'm telling you, folks have been saved through that ministry. I know of Marines that have gotten saved, gave their life to the Lord. And now I know one in particular that is in Idaho right now as a church planter. And I I won't ever forget thinking, this is such an amazing task and and I'm, I'm little old Henry Parker, a pig farmer from Onslow County. And I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I remember praying and asking God to help me. And folks, two years later, I look back and I see, but prayer changed things. Went to Cornerstone. You've heard the story. Our church was on the brink of destruction because of sin. And they said, you'll never pull yourself out of that. You're in debt over a million dollars. You'll never, man, the church will never rise above that. And in the midst of that, I won't never forget hitting the altar and saying, God, I'm only, I'm only 20, I can't remember, I was 24, 25 years old. I said, God, I'm only 24, 25 years old. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to pastor a church. I don't know how to take these people who are suffering. And I remember saying, God, would you please help me? And I want you to know God took a hopeless situation, but prayer changed things. Souls began to be saved. Hey, lives began to be changed. 30 people signed up for soul winning visitation on the spot. May I tell you this morning, prayer changes things. And I'm not just talking about God working in the church. I'm talking about God working in your life. Maybe some of you today have a, have a mountain to climb that you don't know and you don't feel that you can come climb. Maybe today your heart is heavy. Maybe there's a situation. I want you to know, put your situation in Acts chapter 12. It looks gloomy and doomy there at first. But man, when verse 5 gets there, the Bible says, but prayer change everything. I wonder today, Who needs to come to God for help? Are you here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior? You need to run to God for help. Prayer will change your life and change your soul. If you're here today and you're saved and you're going through things but prayer, prayer will change your life. Maybe you'd like to come and pray for your nation today. I'm telling you, it looks hopeless, but I'm going to tell you, but prayer, it changes things. With every head bowed and every eye closed today.